after the fat man and circuit proof. One way to expand Pythagorean triples is by doing this over and over again, and that gives you a new shape of a Pythagorean triple. But if you just start with your original shape, you get the second and final way to generate Pythagorean triples, which is just take a shape that you know works and chop it up. It's easy. Start with a five by five, just like we have been doing. Here's A, A, B, C. But let's just turn that into two times A, two times B, two times C. Well, of course the shape still works, but, but you've got a new Pythagorean triple. So where you did have three, four, five, now you have six, eight, ten. Or if you multiply each one by three, in other words, you take each of the original squares and turn it either into four squares or turn it into nine squares by multiplying these values by three. It's 3a plus 3b plus equals 3c, or uh, three times three is nine. This one was four, so now it's 12. And this one was five, but now it's 15. So nine, 12, 15. It's another Pythagorean triple. Don't forget, when you're making all of the Pythagorean triples, don't forget that once you split these things up, you also want to do the shape-shifting trick on your split Pythagorean triples. So each Pythagorean triple that you generate starts a whole new branch of other Pythagorean triples that you can build by splitting or building your queue. Building the queue makes new shapes, Splitting takes the same shape and makes different values. So you can see, obviously, there's an infinite number of Pythagorean triples, and I think you can find them all if you apply these two methods. I do not have this on a good source because I made all this crap up myself. Okay, now, here's where we start attacking Fermat. I got two things I'm grabbing onto. One is, what I said before, that I think the reason that the Pythagorean triples work is because 2 plus 2 equals 2 times 2. That's one, one of my approaches that I think might have, show some promise. The second thing that I'm grabbing onto here is the possibility that when you build out all these Pythagorean triples, you've got this sort of process that I showed you. Which implies to me, here's where I go out on a limb, that if there exists some huge Pythagorean triple, it can be reduced by doing the same method backwards, by subtracting 2 from its A value, and then reducing the C appropriately and reducing the B appropriately. That, that, would, that would bring the shape back in. And then by looking for common divisors, we can bring the numbers down too. And I believe that if you find, that if you unsplit all the cubes in a huge Pythagorean triple, and you subtract two from its Q value or its A value as many times as you possibly can, I think you'll get back down to this every time. Which implies, very vaguely, that, and this, this is the bomb I'm dropping on you guys, okay? And we'll, we'll, we'll follow up on this, but it implies that if a Pythagorean triple exists, or a, a, a cubic triple existed, that surely there would be a way to build it out into other cubic triples using the same method, but in three dimensions instead of two. And surely if a large one existed, it could be reduced as well. And wouldn't we have some nice low-valued, wouldn't, wouldn't that leave us with some nice, easy-to-understand, low-valued cubic triples? Okay. That logic kind of falls apart if you think maybe the first uh, Fermatic triple to exist is like uh, A to the 3,221,607th plus 
b to the 2000 greater than the seventh equals c to the 2000 greater than the seventh, then reducing it wouldn't really bring the magic numbers into the range that we're used to playing with.